I'd like to introduce you to my former roommate. This is Tom. Tom uh, is now a very successful surgeon. But Tom had an unbelievable problem when we lived together. Tom would never close the door when he was in the bathroom. He would never flush the toilet because he had something called toilet phobia. And although we initially thought this was funny and although we thought this was awkward and annoying, I realized after a deep discussion with my very successful friend now that he had childhood trauma that had impacted various things and gave him this anxiety that had many effects on his life. Trauma has been described as a deeply disturbing event that alters the way you see the world, leading to episodes of learned helplessness, anxiety, and also a loss of sensation. We can laugh about this slide and we can ignore the feelings of trauma and adversity, but it has its tremendous impact on many of us. I must admit, I too have childhood trauma. No, I do flush, but I am afraid of walls. I don't sit on walls. And the reason I don't sit on walls goes into very deep things that occurred in my environment growing up. In the background, you see my grandmother. In an effort to ensure my success in life, she was on a mission to make sure that I could read before I got to kindergarten. Here you see this man-child in the front, and my grandmother would have me do these silly phonemic nursery rhymes. You know the ones, twinkle, twinkle, row, row your boat, and that crazy one about that promiscuous couple, Jack and Jill. What were they really doing up the hill? But the one that she taught to me that I really loathed and loathed to this day was the one about that silly egg placed on a wall. You know the one. And for me, I always thought that I personified Humpty Dumpty, a fragile child in a precarious environment who, if he fell, would be broken so badly that he could not be put together again. And I would venture to say that there were many people who grew up in my environment who felt that. Now, I had a very strong, stable, and loving home, but I grew up with this anxiety about Humpty. Let me paint a picture for you of my life growing up. Here I am with my dog, Spot, looking out across the street, where there were two dilapidated houses with two men who were alcoholics. Uh, they worked during the week, but when it came to the weekends, uh, they drank heavily, they were drunks, and they partied, and they were rowdy with their friends. And the sequence would often happen that there was an altercation, and then there'd be bottles breaking, and then sirens and flashing lights, and my parents ushering me to the back of the house, or if it was late at night, closing the, the blinds, so that I wouldn't be imprinted by these observations. But certainly, I was deeply imprinted. I looked at these men, when I looked at them during the daytime, they were humpty to me. How could they get themselves in this position that they could be so fragile? Where were their families? Where were their loved ones? And more importantly, where was the community? And, and where was society? How could they not matter? And I'd often hear my mother in the back, house, back of the house saying, those no count men, and I worried that I might not count. I'd look at the broken shards of glass on the street, and I'd see this image of Humpty, and it really became a pervasive uh, thought and level of anxiety for me. Well, if I came inside and looked in TV, there are other images of a, a raging, waging war in a far away land, riots, the death of our heroes, and a civil rights struggle that was not only uh, going on away from our city, but my parents were heavily involved in trying to achieve equity for our family in a society that didn't offer that. And in fact, Martin Luther King came to our city to support my family's efforts in that regard. And so I grew up as a young boy with a very blurred picture of what society was 
going to offer. However, I was fortunate. I had this grandmother and family who told me when I talked about this concern about being a Humpty, they said to me that they were better than any king's horses or any king's men, that as my grandmother would say to me, I will make you stronger in the broken places. And that the way we mitigated that fragility, uh, she said, was to have meaning and purpose and focus in your life. So despite the things that might have blurred my future and seeing the world in black and white, I always dreamed in color. And it's this concept of building stability that I think is important as we think about society, as we think about the patients that we care for. My grandmother said, uh, dream. As she said, make no small plans, dream big. And so I did. Uh, I wanted to be an astronaut, like John Glenn or like Neil Armstrong walking on the moon. I was really fascinated with Christian Bernard when he did the first uh, heart transplant. So astronaut, surgeon, and I also wanted to be a social justice leader. Not at the level of Martin Luther King, but at, at a level that would have impact uh, in the community. I left. Lynchburg, Virginia. I went to college and medical school and training and took my first academic job in Pittsburgh at the Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh and began studying the immunobiology of neuroblastoma, the most common extracranial solid tumor of childhood. And my specific interest was the role of dendritic cells in the tumor microenvironment. And we were working to develop uh, uh, tumor vaccines that might be useful in that setting. I also did a lot of surgery on patients who had cancer. And for a young, ambitious, thinner, blacker haired surgeon at the time, taking care of cancer patients was both humanizing as well as humbling. The, the humanizing component is that I saw many people suffer. I, I saw cancer act like violence. It broke the spirit, the mind, and the body of children and their families. It disrupted their family. The chemotherapy that they received not only made them lose their hair, but it affected their long-term fertility. Recurrent disease took away any idea of a future with hope. And the surgery that I did and my partners did sometimes was completely disfiguring. But many of those kids uh, were, were really strong, and, and their families were strong. And what I recognized in the world of pediatric cancer care is that there was a team-based approach to care, and that the team mitigated much of the damage that was done by the therapy. And I recognized uh, something that is probably very trite to people in the cancer world, I, I recognize that we may not be able to cure everyone, but we can heal everyone. That was a mantra within the pediatric unit that I worked in. And so working in that arena, I came to understand not only team-based care, as Dr. Barnholt has just spoken about, but I've, or, or team-based science, I, I also learned to recognize the role of multidisciplinary teams in doing what my grandmother would say is that um, <clears throat> filling in the broken spaces to make patients whole and that our, my patients were not really resilient. They were something beyond resilient because cancer had permanently changed them. They could not go back to where they were. Uh, the, the new patient or the new them, if you will, uh, was stronger in the broken places. And we aspire to that not only in cancer care, but hopefully in society. <clears throat> As I was leaving uh, Pittsburgh, one of the patients I had taken care of, who unfortunately had passed away, uh, her mother came to the office and brought me a gift like you see there. Uh, she knew that I was a big pan, a fan of pottery, but she brought me this Japanese-style pottery that I had not seen before. And this is called kintsugi, or uh, in English it means golden rejoining or golden repair. And this art form in Japan dates back more than 500 years when one of the Japanese shoguns had his favorite tea bowl break. 
and he went all around the country to get it repaired, and no one could fix it. And he found one craftsman who filled the broken places with a gold epoxy. And as a result, the broken vessel became more valuable uh, than the original. And this concept that we wear our scars boldly, and as, a, as opposed to disguising them, I think becomes an important mantra as we approach the care of patients more broadly who are dealing with trauma, whether that trauma is the diagnosis of cancer or that trauma is the result of a bullet or other form of violence. I love cancer. I love cancer research. But I always had this hunkering to do something else. And in 2007, I made a pivot. I came to Cleveland to move from what I felt was academic to success to social significance. I wanted to do something that was more team-based, that was much more collaborative, and that would have an impact on patients uh, broadly in the realm of social justice. I was interested in access, but little did I know that I would get caught in a vortex of violence. The Cleveland that I found in 2007 was one that had many social problems. Uh, you can see number one infant mortality, significant health care disparities in the realm of uh, African American and non African American infant mortality, and one that really signifies the depth of toxic stress, uh, the number one uh, or the highest suicide rate in any school district in the country. Uh, this was moral injury for me. What was I going to do? So I thought about my experiences at Biogen in the, as a visiting scientist in the late 1980s, working with Richard Flavel, and my experience working in the cancer labs in Pittsburgh. I realized that I needed to develop a lab, and this time my lab would be in the community, and this time my lab would be a human-centered lab. Uh, I did some things that I, I, I never imagined I would do. I went to rec centers, churches, schools. I met with teachers. I met with victims. I met with perpetrators. I met with gang members. I met with law enforcement. Uh, I met with a wide variety of people to understand the depths of the problem. Because for me, the violence that I was seeing was much more than that that came from a bullet. It really was pervasive, and it increased the risk of so many other medical morbidities and mortalities. And so if I wanted to have impact or make a difference, I needed to understand Cleveland and the things that impacted healthcare much more broadly, and also Im impacted our ability to deliver that. And in the process of doing these ethnographic things, I came to gain a greater level of empathy and understanding of trauma and its wide impact, not just violent trauma. And I defined the problem in the terms that I could understand it. And we worked, I, when I say I did this, I really did this with a team of people. Although my initial forays were meeting people, I worked with the chief of police and the mayor in order to look at how we might address this problem and move forward. And ultimately, as you will see, we developed a prototype, a model that we're testing and we're moving forward. So we developed this gang intervention program called Op Operation Focus based upon the intense gang violence that was occurring at the time of our arrival in 2007. And uh, this happened. Uh, we went to the chief of police and the mayor and said, this is unacceptable. They said, yes, what are we going to do about it? We set up this program, this gang intervention program. We met in different parts of the city. We brought the SWAT team. We brought mothers who had lost children. We sent them a, t them a tough message. And lo and behold, two years later, uh, we saw results the lowest homicide rate in 50 years. And we felt that we really had addressed the problem. But shortly after, the money ran out, the numbers went higher than they were before. And what I realized in this entire process of being in the community, that it wasn't about the guns. It wasn't about the gun manufacturers. Uh, it wasn't about law enforcement and increasing uh, mass incarceration. Uh, what we saw, uh, the high homicide rate in Cleveland, uh, was the result of despair, poverty, and the empathy gap. And so 
The empathy gap for me, I told you, I learned when I did oncology work that everyone cared for the kids uh, and no one felt that any child who had cancer was guilty. When we take care of kids with violence, we have a treat them and street them mentality. Adults with violence, we somehow see that something they've done is the reason uh, that they may have this problem. So we did a deep dive in looking at our trauma numbers. I, I showed this picture of a young girl who's been featured on a, a really important podcast, I Took Care of Her. She was sitting in a car waiting for her mother to get uh, candles for her father's birthday, and unfortunately, she was killed by a stray bullet. We looked over a two-year period at violence, uh, gun violence in, in Rainbow, Rainbow of all places. Uh, from 2016 to 2017, we identified almost 200 uh, patients who were the result of violence. Not all gun, but of severe assault. But importantly, 30% of our uh, patients during that period of time uh, had recurrent uh, violence, 30 percent, and this is 7 to 15. This isn't the older age. And so I realized that we have a problem that needs a different approach than the ones that we were approaching. And as I had done the work in the community and met so many children who were victims of violence and some who had committed uh, horrific crimes, I, I recognized that we needed to change our language of violence uh, to moral deficiency and to develop a true understanding that these are the people who are injured and healing despite their circumstances. So we developed this program. I read this business book called Anti-Fragile, which talks about the properties of, of structures. So something that's fragile, you drop, it breaks, it's shattered, you can't put it back together. Those things that are robust resist breakage. Um, and then the third property, like DNA, is anti-fragile. When it is broken and it re or comes back together, again, like my grandmother said, it's stronger in those broken places. So we wondered if we could develop a program that we could make the children, uh, particularly those children who were the victims of violent trauma, uh, stronger in the broken places. So we developed this initiative, and I say we, a fourth-year medical student and I put this program together with a number of other collaborators in the community. Um, we collaborated broadly, and uh, we ultimately presented to Michael DeWine when he was Attorney General, and we were funded at $1.3 million to uh, pursue this program. The goal of our program is to reduce secondary violence. Uh, we aim to address and prevent the symptoms of violence and toxic stress, and these can be manifested in subtle ways. And there are people like me who are highly functional, who have seen things but not been a part of things who are impacted by violence. And uh, we want to improve academic or cognitive function and psychosocial mental function and create a hospital that is empathic. This is what we do. A child comes in and we address them within that golden hour uh, of their arrival in the emergency room. We have a group of social workers. We have multiple linkages in the community. And our goal is to really work with them in a strengths-based fashion in order to get them to, to move from where they are to where they should be. We also have a collaboration with the Mandel School, the Center of Ur Urban Poverty and Community Development, where we're trying to uh, bring science to the understanding of these issues that so deeply impact our community. Our goal is to move from, from practice to policy to impact. And that is the path that our approach has taken. Uh, as I briefly uh, review some of the things that, that we've done. We've looked retrospectively at a group of 450 patients over a two-year period that were victims of violence. We've plugged this into what's called the, the child database, which is a big data system that has tracked since 1989 children born in Cuyahoga, I'm sorry, in, in Cuyahoga County and their utilization of services, a wide variety of services. This database helps create a picture of who these children are relative to school attendance and a wide variety of needs. This may not project very well, but this is the demographics uh, of our patients who come in for trauma uh, at Rainbow. 97% are African American and 75% are male, and the average age is 12.9. Um, 
I'm unsure if I could really spell uh, gun or bullet at that age. But regardless, what we've seen and what we've done is that we have um, looked at their demographics and what I show here in just brief summary form is that their lead levels, the kids who have been assaulted or shot, are significantly higher. What we did is we compared them to a location match control of 20,000 students from the Cleveland Metropolitan School District uh, in their same age ranges. And uh, what we see are significant differences in their lead levels, uh, their public assistant levels. They are poorer, greater likelihood of, of lead toxicities, greater likelihood of being involved in the juvenile justice system and also being involved in child maltreatment. And so we realize that their fragility begins shortly after birth. And that is an opportunity for us to intervene, not just as a hospital and not just as a healthcare system, but really as a community, that we need to lean in to uh, this um, effort because we know that childhood adversity increases the risk of long-term complications or issues. So, I came to you today not really to talk about violence or to talk really about trauma. I came to you today to appeal to your humanity as healers, as scientists, as innovators. Because what we need to do in this realm is we need to galvanize the best heads and the best hearts for us to move from a state of a very fragile base of children who are going to be our patients in the future. And that we know that as we lean in and as we create systems that are able to bolster their development, they will have healthy habits. Uh, they will be more productive. They will be less likely to be in, engaged in antisocial behaviors. And so again, as I close, I appreciate the opportunity to address uh, such an incredible group. I appreciate the opportunity to understand innovation and to see how you collaborate so tremendously. We hope to model our program uh, of anti-fragility so that we can move beyond uh, trauma to a state, uh, beyond resilience to a state in which um, patients are good. Let us not just save lives. Let us save whole lifetimes. Thank you.